Hi guys, it's me, Gordon, and welcome to my fourth commentary. You know, today I'm going to do something different. Instead of commentating on a YouTuber that I like, even if the mysterious Mr. Enter's review of the first episode of Troll of Mountain's Mouse was terrible, I'm going to commentate on a YouTuber who I hate. Not only that, it's a part of the social media. Today, we'll be tackling Watch Mojo. You see, Watch Mojo started off as your average media covering organization, but as time went on, and as they grew bigger, they would sell out to the masses and make hundreds of stu uh, stupid top 10 videos. Such as the top 10 movie photographers, the top 10 anti romance songs, and the top 10 getting fired scenes. What's next? The top 10 best Jewish musicians of all time? No offense. If so, then Gene Simmons and Buddy Rich would definitely be on the list. Why are they doing this? Well, according to what I've heard... We've got to have money. That's right, Mr. Lickboot. Money! Now, it's because of their greed that they base their top ten lists off of everybody else's opinions. Don't believe me? Well, in their list of the top ten worst movies of all time, they put Geely at number one and Biodome at number ten. So basically, you think that a boring and offensive rom-com is worse than an annoying and obnoxious stoner comedy. Judging by that, if they made a list of the top 10 best animated movies of all time, they'd put The Lion King or Spirited Away at number 1 because everybody else has that opinion. Well, in my opinion, the greatest animated movie of all time is Aqua Teen Hunger Force Call and Movie Film for, for Theaters, so don't you think that everybody has the same opinion? Another thing I'm going to do different is that this commentary will be a double feature, since I'm going to commentate on, on two of their videos. Both being a top ten lists. I'm commentating on their top 10 best progressive rock bands of all time and top 10 worst cartoon specials of all time lists. Upon commentating on them, I'm going to convert the footage to black and white so as not to have this video taken down, since, you know, Watch Mojo's a social media organization. So without, uh, organization. So without further ado, let's begin, shall we? This genre has captivated fans with its spirit of adventure and ambition, spawning countless concept albums and synthesizer solos. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 progressive rock bands. For this list, We've based our choices on the popularity and impact of bands that spent a large portion of their career recording albums that fit into a progressive rock and or metal category. Okay, see what I was talking about? They base their lists off of everybody else's opinions by judging the entries by their popular and popularity and impact. Acts must have released more than one album that can be classified under the genre, whether it's through elaborate musical arrangements, concept records, or lengthy suites. Number 10, Jethro Tull. In England in the late 60s, Jethro Tull's career has been dominated by the presence of lead singer and songwriter Ian Anderson. Pray, 
His flute playing often provided the unifying characteristic in the band's music, as its style shifted between folky ramblings and harder rocking ravers. Meanwhile, songs like Aqualung, Thick as a Brick, and Locomotive Breath transcended the all right spoiler alert, spoiler alert these mm, some of these entries are also judged by their prime aggressive genre and became staples on classic rock radio <laughs> Number 9, Tool. Wait a second, Tool's not just a progressive rock band, they're more specifically a progressive metal band. Oh well, I'm pretty sure you won't be showing any more metal entries on the list. Oh yeah, right. You showed Dream Theater and Coheed and Cambria, which are also progressive metal bands. And you mentioned having metal candidates. You know what you could have done? Make a separate video called the Top 10 Best Progressive Metal Bands. Of all time. If I were you, I'd put Primus at number one. Proving that the progressive rock movement still had life past the 70s, Tool emerged from Los Angeles in the 90s with a thunderous sound that could not be ignored. Except for music critics. Yeah, about that, progressive rock bands are hated by music critics because they viewed mm, their music to be pretentious. Don't believe me? Why would Robert Christgau give one of Tool's albums, Anima, a dud rating, and why aren't Yes, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Jethro Tull, The Moody Blues, and Toto in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame yet? Despite the change of time, it's an opinion still still held by music um, by music critics to this day. Sucks, doesn't it? Although they only released four albums in the span of 15 years, between 1991 and 2006, each won them critical acclaim and legions of fans. They've even scored three Grammy wins. With vocalist Maynard James Keenan bellowing over sprawling, heavy metal-infused songs with inventive videos, Tool became an unlikely MTV band as well. Number 8, Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Okay, Emerson, Lake and Palmer need to be higher on the list, specifically at number two. That's another problem that I have with this video. It's some of, it's that some of my favorite entries on the list are lower. -er. Keith Emerson and Greg Lake were each part of successful British bands in the 60s before joining forces with drummer Carl Palmer in 1970. One of the first so-called supergroups, ELP sound was dominated by Emerson's keyboards, who brought in classical influences and helped popularize the use of the synthesizer in rock and roll. hit Lucky Man from their debut album paved the way for a series of highly successful and influential albums for the band in the early 70s and beyond. Skipping Coheed and Cambria because there's nothing to talk about other than this woman's deadpan boring voice. King Crimson. Mm -hmm. 
guitarist Robert Fripp is the core member. Don't show Tony Levin when you mention Robert Fripp because people will think that Tony is Robert, just like you did to me. Member of this progressive rock outfit with a consistently changing lineup. Ooh, Their debut album, 1969's In the Court of the Crimson King, established many of the tenets on which progressive rock was based. The band was able to shift from hard-rocking tunes to quiet, weightless jams in a heartbeat. What? That's it? You barely talked about the Greg, uh, the Greg Lake era, uh, the Greg Lake era, and ne and neglected to talk about the John Wetton era. Sure, the Adrian Blue era is my favorite era of King Crimson, but come on, you you have to you have to give Greg and Johnny some credit too. After all, they're a part of the band's history. Number five, yes. English band was one of the few progressive rock bands that had rock radio success thanks to their accessible melodies and singer John Anderson's unique high-pitched voice. The band's multifaceted musical arrangements and multi-tracked harmonies also helped them stand out from the pack. even had comeback success in the MTV era, scoring a huge 80s hit in Owner of a Lonely Heart. And although they've changed lineups often, they've remained a musical force. You know, if you weren't so greedy, then you could have talked about Close to the Edge, Tales from Topographic Oceans, Relayer, and Big Generator. Skipping the Dream Theater for the same reason for Coheed and Cambria. Number 3, Genesis. Oh, oh my god, that bitch just missed me. I wonder who threw it. I wonder who threw it. What? Genesis at number three! Sure, I consider them among the greatest music groups of all time, of all time, but if you weren't so interested in becoming richer than Bill Gates, they would have been at number ten, as deserved. Sure, I'm basing this off of my own opinion. But at least I'm using my own opinion. know Genesis from their years with Phil Collins as the lead singer when they were hugely successful hit makers. But there was a time when Collins was just the drummer and Peter Gabriel was the lead singer. That was when the band made their impact in the world of progressive rock thanks to their intricate instrumental chemistry and Gabriel's charisma as the frontman. No matter who is out in front though, Genesis is a band for the ages. Number two. Rush. A Monday warrior, mean, mean stride. Today's Tom Sawyer, mean, mean pride. With only three main men in the band, you might wonder how such mesmerizingly intricate music is made by Rush. The Canadian trio of Getty Lee, Alex Lifeson, and Neil Peart has built one of the most devoted fan bases in music.
which is one reason why they now reside in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. With Peart playing walloping drums and Penning philosophically probing lyrics, and Lee singing in his penetrating nasal voice. Penetrating? That's it. That's official. These guys are taking it, af uh, taking it after Jan Wanner, regardless if they're using their own opinions. I'm not your buddy, friend. He's not your friend, guy. I'm not your guy, buddy. He's not your buddy, friend. I'm not your friend, guy. Rush is one of the most distinctive bands in any genre. I'm Before we unveil our top pick, here are a few honorable mentions. The Moody Blues on the honorable mentions? They deserve to be on the main list. Okay, I thought this was a list for progressive rock bands. If you want to include Frank Zappa, then, inclu then mention his band, The Mothers of, of Invention, instead. Starting off in the early 60s in the British underground rock scene, Pink Floyd hit the mainstream with a series of blockbuster albums during the following decade. How I wish you were here. We just two lost souls living in a fishbowl year after year. The Dark Side of the Moon and The Wall are two of the 70s defining albums combining atmospheric musical passages with Roger Waters' biting lyrics about heavy topics like war and insanity. You know, I don't mind these guys putting my favorite band at number one, but I'd prefer you to include Roger Waters' singing. Seriously, mention his lyrics but not include his singing? What kind of professionals are you? Although group infighting slowed their progress in the 80s, Pink Floyd still stands as the preeminent prog rock band of their era. Do you agree with our list? What's your favorite progressive rock band? For more musical top 10s published every day, be sure to subscribe to WatchMojo.com. All in all, you're just a another brick in the wall. Oh, so now you include his singing, just partially. Guys, what could I say? These guys managed to do a poor job of mm, mm, a poor list of bands of my favorite form of rock. Now this, now this video, although slightly better and more watchable, shows more signs of stupidity than the one I just showed you. You still alive from the first video? Good. On to the next video. These are the cartoons you'd want to keep clear of your children. I want to tell you something and you better listen. I don't want the children playing outside anymore. Welcome to WatchMojo.com and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 worst cartoon TV specials. 
I will give it this, though. At least this guy's a bit more enthusiastic sounding than the woman in the progressive rock video. Now there's a little play going around. If you feel an itch in your pocket, scratch it! <laughs> For this list, we're counting down animated television specials that were not received well by audiences, and or are just plain bad. We can To qualify, the show must be entirely a cartoon or animated, so shows like Star Wars The Holiday Special and We Wish You a Turtle Christmas don't count because even though they have animated moments, they are mostly live action. It's Christmas um, We Wish You a Turtle Christmas had no animated moments. Oh, you meant metaphorical animated moments. Well, then why did you- well, then why did the Star Wars Holiday Special had a literal one? Had a literal one. God, this is confusing. E and all my friends are here. Wrapping up presents, it happens once a year. Also, we aren't saying that these are the worst cartoon TV specials ever, but we can see why people don't like them. It's go- Ah, great. You show another sign of your greed by including these entries without hating them. Time. Number 10. The Night Before Christmas. So you better watch out. You better not cry. Trade your pouting for some shouting while I testify. See, I'm mighty as a man standing twice my side. With some shorties in the house, you better recognize. The first of several Christmas specials on this list, The Night Before Christmas follows Elvin, an elf, who works in Santa's workshop, that decides he wants to become a rapper. I'm young and I'm strong, I got flow and I'm dapper, that's why I've decided to become a rapper. While he learns the pains of the music industry, Santa and his elves catch a cold, which means that Elvin must escape the record label and save Christmas. I'm the only elf left well enough to make gifts and uphold the tradition of past 25ths. I must travel the road that my forefathers paid. We must postpone the tour. Christmas has to be saved. Despite how interesting the plot may seem, the delivery falls short. Strange animation, annoying voices, and very little substance. And dialogue consisting almost entirely in rhyme. Yes, that's one of the reasons why I hate that special. Are just a few things on the list of problems plaguing this special. I'm coming as scheduled. There'll be no delay. It's business as usual. All hail Christmas Day! Number 9. The Christmas Tree. Skipping the Christmas Tree. Brace yourselves, everybody. This is where things get really stupid. Number 8. Shrek the Halls. Jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle bell, don't get Good call. Uh, not so much. I don't believe this. You deemed an otherwise decent special as the 8th worst animated special. It seems DreamWorks has a habit of giving their most successful franchises a Christmas special, and Shrek is no exception. Actually, Shrek is one that isn't an exception, because the only other DreamWorks franchise I know that has a Christmas special, well, two in fact, and actually, is Madagascar. Yeah, most of these entries on the list are Christmas specials. Enough! I don't care about any of this nonsense! Shrek the Halls is your standard Christmas tale about someone promising his family a great Christmas, but then things go wrong and it ruins the holiday spirit. Donkey! Will you get it through your thick head? No one here gives a hoot about Christmas! That is, until people find the true meaning of Christmas, and everything is happy again. It's hard to tell which way is up, or down or out, or through. It's not a bad story. Then don't include it! But with the way the Shrek franchise has clearly retold fairy tales, you think they could have put a new and more entertaining spin on this story in this special. And I heard him exclaim as he drove out of sight, Smelly Christmas to all, and to all a gross night. Number 7. SpongeBob's Atlantis Square Pantis. To blow a bubble. Oh, 
How strange is it that you go back to the cleverness after including a ridiculous entry? Of all the people to discover the fabled city of Atlantis, when Spongebob and the gang discover an ancient medallion in this made-for-TV special, they are whisked off to the lost city so they can see the oldest bubble ever blown. Even Plankton tags along so he can steal an Atlantean weapon or two. These Atlanteans leave a room full of the most advanced weaponry unguarded? No wonder they got lost. Despite the grand adventure setting, their trip to Atlantis is a bit underwhelming, with forced musical numbers and a silly plot. I still can't believe that they wasted David Bowie by not making him seen in this. If he did seen, then the musical numbers would have some sort of purpose. May he rest in peace, his poor soul. As for the musical, not as for the plot, I wouldn't call it silly. I think a more accurate uh, a more accurate term would be half-assed. Goodbye, Atlantis. But we really have to go. Back to a little town that is the greatest place I know. But at least it's more exciting than getting trapped in the Krusty Krab's air ducts and having a flashback episode like the Bikini Bottom residents do in SpongeBob's Truth or Square. Well, then why did you include Atlantis Square Pantus? Oh, yeah! Money! We want more money. Yeah, more money. Oh no, Patrick, stand up! We're locked in! This is gonna spoil the 117th anniversary! Number 6, Frosty Returns. This ain't upset, kid. This is panic. I'm too squirts from being history. The original Frosty the Snowman cartoon was a light-hearted tale about a snowman brought to life by a magical hat. Happy birthday! That hat brought Frosty to life! However, in this not really a sequel sequel, which was produced by a different production company and features different characters and voice actors, things aren't so lighthearted. Frosty Returns sees Frosty team up with two kids named Holly and Charles to stop the evil scientist Mr. Twitchell from taking over the town. I'm about to give this town the greatest gift ever. A winter with no shoveling, no slush, no frostbite, clean streets and dry sidewalks. By this weekend, snow tires will be ancient history! He tries to accomplish this by inventing an aerosol spray that melts snow and winning over Beansboro with his invention. What is this stuff? Well, it's the greatest invention since microwave pancakes. It's called Summer Wheeze. Remember when Frosty was just about kids having fun in the snow? No, it was also about Frosty trying to maintain his survival. Apparently, the people behind this TV special don't. One friend is a lot different than no friends. One friend is plenty. You're right. Especially when it's you. Number five, Barbie in the Nutcracker. He's wonderful. It seems all you need to make a Christmas special are familiar brands and one of the many holiday-inspired stories. Here. We'll fix this right up. When Barbie's friend Kelly is having trouble practicing her ballet dance, Barbie tells her the story of the Nutcracker and how a human girl helps a prince reclaim his throne from the Mouse King. The trees smell like peppermint, and I've never seen a sky so blue. Soon it'll all be a memory if the Mouse King has his way. The computer animated and motion capture film is just Barbie reciting a tale we've heard many times before. Sure, they use some of the classic songs we know from the Nutcracker, but that's what the real stage show is for. Aw, oh, come on, give this movie some credit. At least I can't think of another project that has Kathleen Barr and Tim Curry perform together. Oh, yeah. Number four. Grandma got run over by a reindeer. I tell you to put a cork in it, you greedy money grubber. But Grandma shouldn't talk that way. If you've heard the song, you pretty much know the plot. Grandma got run over by a reindeer. 
Walking home from our house Christmas Eve. Grandma gets hit by a reindeer, Santa takes her to the North Pole to help her recover, and an evil cousin tries to take over the family and sue Santa Claus. We guess you have to take a few liberties if you're trying to create a plot around a song. But despite a couple of catchy couple of catchy tunes, including the one about suing Saint Nick, Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer is a bland story that is quickly forgotten. Ah, uh, give this special some credit. At least I can't think of another project that has Kathleen Barr and Cam Clark perform together. Oh yeah. Well, at least I can't think of another project that has Kathleen Nabar and Rick Moranis perform together. I'm still waiting for Kathleen Nabar and Tom Kenny to perform together. Somebody make that happen! Number 3. Cartoon All-Stars to the Rescue Toto. Something tells me we're not in cartoon territory anymore. There's nothing wrong with informing kids about the effects of drugs, but how you go about it can make or break something like this. Oh, what's that funny smell? I hate to suggest this, but my guess would be marijuana. An unlawful substance used to experience artificial highs. In Cartoon All-Stars to the Rescue, Cory discovers her brother has been smoking marijuana and goes on a quest with different cartoon characters like Winnie the Pooh and Bugs Bunny to get him to change his ways. What's this? A joint? So what's the big attraction? I mean, uh, how did you get started anyway? I started because I wanted to. What do you care? It sounds like a good idea on paper, but due to the end result, we have to assume that someone was on something when they actually made this. Oh, so now you use your own opinion. Ah! <laughs> oh, there just is no sense in the world, is there? <laughs> Number two, Christmas comes to Packland. Inky, no! You're throwing the power pellets! And we're munching them! Many video games got the cartoon treatment in the 80s, and Pac-Man is no exception. Oh, well, don't worry, Santa. We'll save Christmas for you. Due to the success of the animated show, it was only a matter of time until Christmas showed up in Pac-Man's hometown. Packy! What is it? I don't know, but it's headed this way! Duck! Brace yourselves, we're going to crash! In this special, Pac-Man and his friends must save Santa after he crashes and discovers his toys have been stolen. Don't worry about me! You've gotta save Santa's toys! The cartoon is pretty standard fare with Santa not knowing Pac-Man existed, and Pac-Man not knowing about Christmas, and everybody learns a lesson in the end. Ay 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 ay, we get that your problem with a few of these specials is that that they're cliched and, and unoriginal. Put a sock in it already! Never heard of Christmas? Why, it's the most wonderful time of the year. It's the season of giving and receiving. A time of peace on earth and goodwill towards man. And what's the lesson in question? Find a better Christmas special to watch. Just think of the millions of deserving children around the world who won't get their Christmas presents if you open your mouths instead of your hearts. <laughs> Before we reveal our top pick, here are a few honorable, or in this case, dishonorable mentions. I have to turn in my essay. Hey, cut some slack. At least this was made by Chuck Jones. Going to spread joy and happiness? Dad, Dad, no, you don't see. See, these are more than mere socks. They're plates to keep your feet. You got a heel for a heel, you got a toe for a toe. Put them on in the daytime and they're good to go. Yeah, but that's because... Because you go to... Mo hey, why wasn't this on the main list? Monster High, where you can be yourself, freaky flaws and all. That's why we need to welcome the new students with open arms. Number one. He-Man and She-Ra, a Christmas special. It's a Christmas tree, 
and it's to celebrate Christmas. Oh, what's Christmas? Everybody knows what Christmas is. I don't. When you get lots of presents. When children become stranded on Eternia, it is up to He-Man and She-Ra not only to protect the children, but also to make sure that they have the perfect Christmas. I've got an idea. Christmas isn't for several days yet, but the twins' birthday is tomorrow. Why don't we combine their birthday celebration with a big, big Christmas party? What at first sounds like the best Christmas special ever quickly falls flat when you realize that it's just another holiday cash-in on an already famous cartoon. Okay, this is the only uh, legitimately agreeable statement, but not a legitimately agreeable entry. Why? Because I think number one should be the fight for the Fox Box. Why isn't this on the list? Oh yeah, because it has an almost lack of legitimate value and is not well known. Garbage! We expected He-Man and She-Ra to fight bad guys, not to teach us the spirit of Christmas. Well, I think you're feeling the Christmas spirit, Skeletor. It makes you feel good. Well, at least Skeletor has some of his n usual self at the end. Make them fight a giant robotic Santa created by Skeletor. That's what we want for Christmas. Oh, thank you, Mr. Skeletor. You saved us. You really are wonderful. So. Do you agree with our list? Well, only four of those entries I do. It's not a joke! Wait, where's the bubble? <gasps> what cartoon specials do you hate the most? If you got news to tell, what's the dealio, man? Are we starting to sell? For more entertaining top tens published daily, be sure to subscribe to WatchMojo.com. Don't leave, Frosty. Don't worry, kid. I'll be back. Give me some time to find me a new bow tie. And that was those horrible Watch Mojo videos. <sighs> you know, guys, I don't think America is the only country source for greed. I now think that Canadian companies can be greedy, too. <sighs> you know what? I'm done. Ooh, before I leave, I should mention that I love Biodome.